what do you get when you take a relatively unused concept for a film, add a dash of Mr. T and Gary Busey, sprinkle in a pinch of the Barbarian Brothers and Marsha Warfield? Well, you get DC Cam, and we're going to talk about it today. You're on Captain Adam's VHS pirate ship, and this is Captain's Corner. Sit back and relax and have a good time. You'll learn a few things on Captain's Corner. 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 It's Captain's Corner. Film reviews and home video history. Today's topic: DC Cam. DC Cab. In my opinion, one of, if not the most underrated 80s comedies of all time. It totally deserves a hell of a lot more of attention than what it gets, and it just does not seem like people talk about this film all that much. And why is that? Is it because a vast majority of people do not like this film? Is it just one of those movies that nobody looks twice at? Or is it because people assume it's a 70s movie and not an 80s movie at all? Yeah, I can't really explain it, nor can I elaborate, but this just feels like a late 70s movie. Like, if you were to tell me this movie was made in 77, I totally would believe you. But it wasn't. It was released in theaters December 16th, 1983. And during that initial period, it would carve out a bit of a legacy. And its theatrical debut was fairly successful, raking in $16 million at the box office to counter an $8 million budget. So they doubled their money, and this was anything but a flop. And a large amount of that success is truly owed to the cast. Or is it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is. Yes, this film famously stars Mr. T right alongside Gary Busey, and trust me, he is very Gary Busey in this. I'm pretty sure he thought all of this was really happening. And it's arguable, well, actually, I don't think it's arguable at all, that this film's success is all due in part to Mr. T. In 83, he was basically on fire, in a good way. He was everywhere. He was fresh off the heels of Rocky Three. he was starring in the massively successful television show The A-Team, he would just pop up anywhere he wanted. And to everyone that was involved in DC Cavs production knew this damn well. And even though he's not really the main character nor the focal point of the film, they used him to sell this movie. I mean, look at the poster. Wow. Yeah, this poster is all about Mr. T. Though he is in the film for a good amount of time, he's more like a supporting character and hardly warrants this real estate on the poster. But I love it, and I certainly do not blame them for doing this. They wanted to let you know Mr. T was in this damn film. People clearly went to go see this movie because of him. And it's funny how his popularity would turn the actual main characters of the film into a supporting cast. However, the film is so well written and well performed, you do care about these other characters characters, but still, you just want to see more Mr. T. But oddly enough, this film would still work well without him. The other characters are well acted and interesting, and you do want to know more about them. The dialogues and the chemistry between these other characters is very powerful and engaging, more so than what is typical for a movie like this. And I was very surprised at how many intricate layers this film has, and it seems like all of the characters have a backstory that's either interesting or tragic or both. The film never really delves in deeply to any of that, but it does an excellent job at hinting at it. Now, you couldn't tell from the poster, but this film is actually about Albert Hockenberry, an aspiring young man who wants to break into the taxi cab business. So he seeks out his late father's army buddy, Harold, who owns the rundown taxi company, DC Cab. And DC Cab's payroll is loaded with a motley crew of characters that are way more interesting than they should be. Not only do we have Mr. T and Gary Busey in this bunch, but the cast of characters includes people like Paul Rodriguez, Charles Barnett, a pre-Night Court Marsha Warfield, Bill Mayer, is it Mayor or Mar? Oh, I don't know. And the Barbarian Brothers. And that's interesting in and of itself, because why are the Barbarian Brothers in this movie? It just seems so out of place, but welcome all the same. If you tried to explain to someone who the Barbarian Brothers were, it does sound a little weird. They were bodybuilders that were twin brothers, and they would use this to their full advantage. They had a totally unique gimmick, and they would star in a number of films. None of them were really that good, but still, at a time, they were a big part of the cinematic landscape. Peter and David Paul were their actual names, but they would just become known as the Barbarian Brothers. Well, actually, I suppose that was right out of the gate, because DC Cab was one of their first movies, and that's how they're referred to in the credits. In fact, in the end credits, they're referred to as Peter Barbarian and David Barbarian, and that just sounds really funny. You know, I've always kind of thought they were called the Barbarian Brothers because of their 1987 film, The Barbarians, but 
but it turns out they were always called that. Yeah, I didn't watch DC Cab until fairly recently, so I never really put two and two together. Uh, so anyways, the main character, Albert, is portrayed by Adam Baldwin. Uh, another Baldwin? How many were there? Geez, were they starting a basketball team? Okay, so he's not a Baldwin brother, but he is distantly related. And the other main character of Harold is portrayed by Max Gale of Barney Miller fame. And it's funny, in this film, Max Gale has a striking resemblance to early Macho Man. Uh-huh. The resemblance is uncanny. Uh-huh. This movie is a lot of fun. It has the underdog storyline archetype. But this film does have a bit of a split personality. Because more than halfway through it, it shifts gears and becomes like a rescue mission movie. Which is okay, it keeps it fresh, but still, it's sort of out of left field. This film also has some surprisingly interesting imagery, most especially the pre-opening credit scene, which is actually sort of creepy, and you don't really know what kind of movie this is going to be. But the joke's on us because we soon realize this is going to be a shenanigan-filled fun film. When I first watched this, I was sort of wondering if it was going to be a raunch comedy like some 80s movies were prone to be. Shortly into the film, we have this scene, and then I'm like, oh, okay, so it is. Oh, another raunchy comedy. How surprising. But not with Mr. T around. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen on his watch. He wasn't going to stand for this kind of crude and cheap gag. Yeah, for a second there, I thought DC Cab was going to be just another 80s raunch comedy, but Mr. T made short work of that. And this is by far my favorite scene in the movie because it felt so personal. Yeah, I'm really not a fan of raunch, and Mr. T saved me from a cringy movie. At least that's how it felt. I was really happy that he did this. This movie sort of reminded me of how much of a fan of Mr. T I really was. He was a powerful 80s icon. He was someone to look up to. He was a crusader for good and a defender of decency. And DC Cab really plays into that and it makes you very glad that he's in this movie. And like I said, this film would work without him, but it would be a lot different. Everything in this film works fairly well and that's what you get with good directing. Speaking of that, I was very surprised when I found out that Joel Schumacher directed this. Granted, that might be old news to you, but like I said, I didn't watch this film until fairly recently, so it's all news to me. Yes, Joe Schumacher, the director behind many fine films like The Lost Boys, Falling Down, uh, Batman Forever, and Batman and Robin. Yes, it's a shame that he would eventually become best known for those latter two films, which are piles of dog shit. As soon as Batman Forever was released, the public awareness of Joel Schumacher went through the roof. Yeah, it seemed like no one really knew who Schumacher was until Batman Forever. And it would be after the fact that people would seemingly go back and look and say, hey, he directed The Lost Boys, he directed Falling Down, and he directed DC Cab. He also directed Flatliners. St. Elmo's Fire, an 8mm, as well as a billion other things. But sadly, Batman Forever would always overshadow his career. At least seemingly so, but it is proof that you could do a million things right, but do one thing wrong, and that's all people ever talk about. For some reason, people just love to dwell on the negative, and this case right here is a splendid example of that. Now, I know I'm supposed to be talking about DC Cab, but let me talk about the Schumacher Batman films for a second. These two movies are sequels to the 1980s. 89 Batman, which of course was directed by Tim Burton. And that film is rather dark and brooding, and there's hardly any campiness in it whatsoever. You fast forward to Batman Forever, and it's like a totally different universe. It's basically the exact opposite of the 1989 Batman film. And of course, Batman and Robin is the same way, and I've found that that's primarily why people have such a problem with these films. They're too campy, they're too outlandish, they're too different from the original Batman in which they're supposed to be sequels of. And I do understand that, in fact, I concur completely, but my thing is, why don't people think this way about Batman Returns? Which is the direct sequel to the 89 Batman and is directed by Tim Burton as well, but you, you already knew that. And for a sequel, that movie is pretty different from what it's following up. Plenty of campiness in it, plenty of outlandishness, and come on, Penguin Commandos? It's all a bit too much to take, and in my opinion, Batman Returns should be judged as harshly as Batman Forever. But people love Batman Returns, and to me it makes no sense not to shit on it. And um, how exactly does Selena Kyle become Catwoman again? Uh, I just, just for clarification, I mean, what is what is happening here? 
Uh, oh, that's right. They never explain it. Oh, that's great. I do understand that sometimes too much story gets in the way, but it might have been a good idea to explain this. And even though they're rubbish, the Schumacher Batman films do tell their stories rather nicely. And despite the fact that they were crap, they were still decently directed. And I know that doesn't make much sense, but it is possible to have a bad movie that was directed well, which I guess is like your dog taking a shit in the perfect spot. I recently rewatched the Schumacher Batman films, whether it's because, hey, sometimes things deserve another look or perhaps I'm a masochist either way I wanted to check them out again and yes they are complete dribble just as I remembered them to be but there was something I noticed about Batman and Robin I really think that this movie is trying to be like the 1966 Batman television show wherein it's completely fun and outlandish and corny and not like the 89 Batman movie at all I mean come on they could not have been trying to do this film seriously the viewing audience are the ones that assume that this movie is supposed to be taken seriously. We're, We're the, the ones, ones that have done it. it. It's our perception that has made this movie shit. Well, that and the fact that this movie is shit. Perception is everything, and it helps to watch this movie with the mindset of the 1966 Batman television show, which does make this movie a little bit more forgivable and maybe just a tad bit more palatable, but the same principle does not apply to Batman Forever. That movie is just absolute rubbish. Yeah, it just doesn't work. It seems like they were trying to do this movie seriously, and it just did not translate very well. But anyways, clearly I've digressed, and, uh... What the hell was I talking about? Ah, yes. Schumacher was a great director, and DC Cab is a prime example of his ability. Though I think it's a rather fine film, the critics, however, did not. Oh, there's a shocker. Now, everyone has their own opinion, and they're entitled to them. This, that, and the fourth. And I couldn't agree more, but some of these criticisms just don't make a whole lot of sense to me. Good old Roger Ebert, well, he kind of liked it, and described it overall as mindless, likable confusion. You know, I think that's rather unfairly broad, and on the surface, this movie might seem mindless, but do a little digging. This movie is anything but mindless. But mindless. But mindless. Now, the state of being without a but mind. You really don't have to dig too far to find out that this film isn't but mindless. I'm sorry, <laughs> isn't mindless. As I had mentioned before, it's implied that all the characters have relatively deep backstories. There seems to be sort of a manic sadness about them. I mean, this film should be mindless, but it's not. Film critic for the Washington Post, Edward Sargent, wrote that this film contains large doses of vulgarity meant to get several cheap laughs. No, it doesn't. There really isn't anything vulgar about this movie. Mr. T took care of that. There's not much basis for that criticism, and I'm really confused by it. Did we see the same movie? But perhaps the most pretentious and ignorant criticism comes from Ian Buckwalter of the Washington City Paper, who stated and I quote, I'm not going to argue that DC Cab is a great movie, or even a good one. It wasn't a hit when it was released in 83, and it would probably be a stretch to even call it a cult favorite. Since whatever cult exists around it is probably limited to Mr. T completist and a cadre of local film obsessives. I'm not even sure what that really means, but he continues. By any rational measure, DC Cab is pretty terrible. It's standard 80s underdog strike back fare. It's revenge of the nerds with taxis. <laughs> Okay, sure, I agree, DC Cab is an 80s underdog comedy in which there were many of, but his criticism infers that DC Cab is just another one of those, when it was basically one of the first. And uh, comparing this film to Revenge of the Nerds is rather silly and pointless and stupid. It isn't anything like Revenge of the Nerds. And since Revenge of the Nerds came out after DC Cab, that's a highly inaccurate thing to say. So it really should be Revenge of the Nerds is like DC Cab, which makes even less sense. Sometimes you gotta wonder if critics even watch these movies. I mean, come on, it would be easy to lie and say you did. Who's gonna check? Who's gonna make sure you really watched the movie? You could just make something up. It's all your opinion anyway. It can't get that wrong. Yet somehow these people kind of did. The basis for these opinions just seem a little off, but it doesn't really matter anyway. None of this matters. I like the movie. They did not. Big, Big deal. deal. Despite what Mr. Buckwalter said, DC Cab was sort of a hit. Granted, not too much of one, but in reality, if your movie comes in just a little bit over budget, then it is rather successful. And like basically any movie, it would have a second life on home video. It would first be released in 1984 by MCA Home Video on VHS, Betamax, Laserdisc, and CED. And here's where it gets just a little bit tricky. MCA Home Video was the home video arm of Universal Pictures, making it a 
major home video distributor. And back then, major home video distributors would do this weird thing where they would initially release a movie on VHS, then re-release the same movie two years later with identical packaging, with basically the only difference being the year that's printed on the cassette label. The original US VHS distribution of this film will not say 84 anywhere on it. The date printed on the cassette label will state 1983, being that this film wasn't released until December of 1983, and back then, movies weren't released on home video until months after they left theaters, this just does not add up. Though it's not official, I'm giving you the Captain Atom guarantee that the VHS, Betamax, Laserdisc, and CED weren't released until 1984. MCA Home Video would re-release this in 1986 in identical packaging. The only difference is the date printed on the cassette label. And that is where they got a little bit weird. So if you have this, do not assume you have the first distribution. Yes, look a little bit closer. And as they say in forensic science, don't assume, exhume. Okay, I don't know if they actually say that, but they totally should. Hey, since we're talking about it, did you ever wonder what MCA Home Video stands for? Hmm, well, now that you mention it. Other than being one of the Beastie Boys, MCA stands for Music Corporation of America, which began its life as a media conglomerate in 1924. It would eventually be acquired by Universal Pictures, and then once home video became a thing, Universal Pictures would rebrand it as their home video division. MCA home video would be a big deal. It would become a symbol of the 1980s, and just the logo alone reminds you of that blessed decade. But Universal would eventually absolve the whole thing and sell off some of its properties to Good Times Home Video. And DC Cab was one of those said properties, which gives us the 1996 Good Times Home Video distribution. And this should be pretty cut and dry, but even this is not. It had two different distributions in the same year by the same distributor. One cassette had a paper sticker label, the other had an ink stamp. For shit's sakes, can't we just do one or the other? Man, I tell you, variants are the bane of any collector of anything. Stupid variants! Yep, be it baseball cards or battle beast, variants will always give you a headache. Variant bastards! Quite a few home video distributors would do this sort of thing. Media Home Entertainment was also one of the major culprits. And if you're a VHS collector, you could expect this kind of behavior from Good Times Home Video as well. It is what it is, and I suppose it's not really that big of a deal. Now, What's rather interesting is comparing and contrasting the cover art of DC Cab between the MCA home video release and the Good Times home video release. Or should I say release is because there was two different ones of each. Instead of using a version of the original poster, the Good Times home video distribution sort of just made up its own thing. Here you can see that Mr. T still maintains a major part of the imagery real estate, much like the original poster. And even though by 96, Mr. T's popularity had waned, they were still using him as a major selling point for this film, just as the marketing for this film had always done, even though Mr. T is not the main character. But they knew, even in 96, that the only reason people would see this film would be because of him. The overall design of the Good Times home video slipcover is in the same vein as the original poster, wherein Mr. T is the focal point, and at the bottom, there's a lot of shenanigans from the movie. However, in contrasting the two, it does seem like the Good Times home video cover art is a bit cheap, and its spirit seems somewhat lessened. And it kind of looks like a 10th grader did this as a layout project for photography class, and they got a B minus. Or maybe even a C plus. It's not bad, but it's also not good. And like I said, it does look cheap, but that was the point of Good Times Home Video. They were an economic distributor, which means their price points were very low which means they weren't spending a lot of money on production, which would have included layout designs, which apparently they would hire 10th graders to do. The MCA home video distribution was not economic, and you can certainly tell. The cover art is gorgeous, and that's just because it's basically the poster, which was pretty awesome to begin with. It's just very striking. It makes you want to see the movie. It's how a poster should be done. And that is why I obtained this tape for my collection, because I was compelled to buy it. I had to have it. I had known about the movie, but I had never seen it until I bought this MCA home video distribution. And no, I don't have the original 84 distribution. I have the 86 facsimile. In closing, DC Cab is a film that I'm very glad I finally watched. It's a well-done movie with a unique concept. I mean, come on, how many movies are there about driving taxis? Even Taxi Driver isn't really about driving a taxi, is it? DC Cab is one of those films that just does not get a lot of attention, and it really should. It's a well-paced film, and even though the plot seems to go in several different directions sometimes, it's easily forgivable because it's so enjoyable. The characters are deep and intriguing, 
And the dialogue is great, you want to hear more of it. There's a lot of unique things about this film, like seeing Macho Man Max Gale with a flamethrower, or seeing Mr. T and the Barbarian Brothers crash into a house together, or seeing Marsha Warfield hand Bill Mayer a vibrator. This movie is just a lot of fun, and it's underrated, which means it's Thunderrated! In my opinion, if you have not seen this film, check it out. It is worth your time. I dug DC Cab, but do you dig DC Cab? Let me know in the comments below. Well, that about does it for this edition of Captain's Corner. I had a lot of fun talking about DC Cab and the Batman movies for some reason. I hope you had a lot of fun too. Be sure to hit subscribe, take care out there, and keep it locked right here, only on Captain Adam's VHS Pirate Ship Ret Ret Retro Reviews.